as Tim said, uh, my name is Beatrice Brailsford. Uh, I have worked for this. I worked for the Snake River Alliance for 30 years. I am newly retired, um, and uh, but still very interested in both the nuclear situation at at INL and in what uh, this this effort has turned into over the years. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, some of the background of where we are and why we're here today. Um, the Idaho National Laboratory is on the Arco Desert, which is in eastern Idaho. Eastern Idaho is a beautiful part of our state. It's about 4,500 feet above sea level. Uh, it has lava flowing on it about every 2,000 years. Uh, the, the temperature range is 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, most important of all, uh, people have lived there for over 13,000 years. So when, uh, when you hear that the Idaho National Laboratory is in the middle of nowhere, don't believe it. Uh, the other really important thing about INL is that it was built above the Snake River Aquifer. Uh, the Snake River Aquifer, I'll give you these numbers, but each one of these numbers means big. The Snake River Aquifer has between one and two times the water, as is in Lake Erie. It underlies 10,000 square miles of southern Idaho. Uh, it is key to our agricultural community's uh, efforts. And most important of all, it is the sole source, EPA has designated it as the sole source of drinking water for more than 300,000 of our friends and neighbors. Uh, so INL was built there in 1949. It covers 890 square miles. Um, it has substantial water rights. Um, and it employs now, oh, I'd say five to 7,000 people. Um, and it has been, um, it's had a lot of missions that I'm gonna tell you about some of them tonight. Um, in the meantime, I'm trying to see, okay, I did take that slide out. Um, so more about INL. It, is, it was established in 1949 as the National Reactor Testing Station. It was built to um, encourage commercial nuclear power. It was in some ways the United States' embrace of commercial nuclear power was um, as a kind of uh, public relations thing so that we would not be simply war-like. We, we would be lighting the world as well. Uh, but at any rate, INL was the uh, commercial R&D site. Uh, and it was very early on, became the site for the uh, nuclear Navy's testing of its own reactors and training. Uh, the prototype for the USS Nautilus, which was the very first nuclear-powered vessel, uh, was tested at the Idaho National Laboratory. And then as the prototype hit problems or succeeded, the people at INL would tell the people who were actually working on the reactor, on the, on the other reactor, the non-prototype, the actual, uh, what was going wrong or right. So they mimicked an entire uh, voyage across the Atlantic at you know, right there in the middle of the Arco Desert. And they did all of that, of course, without any kind of containment of the radiation that was released in those tests. And then it did become a pretty significant training site, site for the sailors who ran subsequent ships. Very early on, you know, so we were going to be a commercial site, and then all of a sudden, Navy's there. Very early on, by like 1952, we became a disposal site for the nuclear weapons complex. Um, specifically, Idaho received most of the plutonium contaminated waste from the Rocky Flats plant in Colorado. Uh, but in some ways, um, you know, waste disposal seems like the end of the line and not that important, but if you're dealing with something that can't go anywhere else and you'll accept it, 
you are a very important part of the nuclear weapons endeavor. Uh, and last, we did do nuclear weapons reprocessing. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, the technical part of it, as we go along. It is reprocessing, you know, at the end of the day, reprocessing is the must-take step between a nuclear reactor and a nuclear bomb. So when we started that, we became a part of the nuclear weapons complex. You know, the N National Reactor Testing Station uh, was successful. Uh, the first four light bulbs um, illuminated with nuclear power were lit at the Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, it grew over time. That was from the uh, experimental reactor, reactor one. Over time, uh, Arco, Idaho became the first city lit by nuclear power. Um, they did other things at INL having to do with nuclear power. A lot of the tests on nuclear power were actually driving the equipment to failure. So that looks like an accident, and we had had a bad accident there. But that's not an accident. That was an on purpose. How long do you have? Can you do something before the thing blows up? Uh, we were also, as I said, the birthplace of the nuclear navy. Uh, the USS Nautilus was um, essentially born here. Uh, early on, as I said, we became the the target site for a lot of the plutonium waste that was produced by Rocky Flats. In the very earliest days, the trucks came in and men in kind of baker suit, bakery suits unloaded the barrels by hand and put them in the pits. Um, and then they figured out that that was causing a substantial amount of radioactive exposure. Uh, and barrels came in in the dump trucks they were dropped by, um, just dropped. The Department of Energy itself um, estimated that half of the containers of plutonium had breached before they, they were buried. So after a while, the US government realized that was not a good idea and, decide, and started what I think of as burying it above ground. So in 1970, they started piling these barrels of plutonium waste on asphalt. So barrel, barrel, plywood, and then would cover the whole thing with dirt, which is why I call it above ground buried. Ultimately, that pile of dirt was seven acres big. And it's that right there. So this whole area is buried waste, and this is above ground buried waste. That um, stopped um, in, as I said, 1988. A kind of waste coming in that did not stop and has not stopped is spent nuclear fuel from the nuclear Navy. Uh, spent nuclear fuel is where you get plutonium. Uh, people interested in nuclear activities, particularly aggressive ones, are very keen on plutonium. In a reactor, the only, the only way you get plutonium is when the, these, this fuel is irradiated and it transforms uranium into plutonium. And that's the precious, precious part to uh, nuclear weapons developers. And it is extracted out of those spent fuel rods in reprocessing. Reprocessing as much fuel as in a six inch lead pencil creates eight gallons of radioactive acidic waste. And it's a nightmare to manage. Uh, Hanford, where most of the largest inventory here in the United States is, is a nightmare. It's probably the most contaminated place on Earth. This is a picture of one of INL's 
tanks where they stored the radioactive acid. Uh, they're buried below ground. This is 300,000 gallons. Uh, and you can see it, when, it, when it went in, it was so radioactive, you know, they have refrigerator coils in the bottom of the tanks. A lot of what was going on um, really disturbed people in Idaho. Uh, the Snake River Alliance did have a, an effort called Stop the Shipments. Um, and we would uh, witness every shipment of spent fuel that came in. Uh, we didn't, we were not a sovereign nation. Fort Hall Reservation is a sovereign nation. They stopped the trains, which they did. Uh, the, Shoban, the Shoshone-Bannock tribes have been very firm about nuclear material crossing the reservation. And you know, that part of the world where 13,000 years of people have lived, those are Shoban ancestors. So a lot, a lot of public pressure ultimately uh, ended up with the 1995 settlement agreement. Uh, it is a good agreement. It did give us um, firm deadlines for treating and uh, removing waste. It bans, banned and bans to this day, commercial waste coming to Idaho. And it does say that out-of-state waste, if it did come in, would have to be treated and removed within a year. The settlement agreement wasn't the first to push cleanup at INL, but it was certainly mo the most politically, um, ha the highest profile politically. The first effort was, of course, INL was a Superfund site. Uh, and then in 1991, when the aquifer was named a sole source drinking water supply, uh, everybody was, became pretty focused on cleaning up INL. INL's cleanup program, because of citizen activism, because of very strong state engagement, is one of the more successful programs in the country. Uh, it is dangerous work. You're out there digging up plutonium with the track hoe, and you know, the guy running that track hoe has anti-sea suit on, he's breathing outside air, um, and it's dangerous work. They're doing a good job. And then after they dig all the waste up, you know, the end of the nuclear age is you sort nuclear waste by hand. And that's uh, what also happens at INL. So the, the, the cleanup program has been very successful. There are a lot of real threats left. Um, first of all, our land and water will be contaminated until the end of time. Plutonium remains hazardous for a quarter of a, mil of a million years. You know, those tanks of liquid waste at INL, they were dry, the liquid was dried, some of it, most of it. But then look, and we've got many, many of these bins they call them bins, but there's the guy. So that's a lot of waste in there. Uh, but at any rate, you know, cleanup is what cleanup is. Um, once, pluton once, once contamination is out and about, it's out and about. Just recently, a new push, a new mission has been embraced uh, to go back to nuclear power development. Uh, and that is what we are looking at today. And it has some real, um, real problems that I think the people of Idaho should be aware of. First of all, you've got to, you know, some, the reason nuclear power died is because it's a really stupid technology. And starting in 1954, General Electric said, you know, this was going to be uh, too cheap to meter. In 2011, the Union of Concerned Scientists did a study of every dollar that went into nuclear power and public dollar, public money, federal subsidies, and concluded that it would be cheaper if the government had just bought the electricity and given it away for free. So that is still the case 
today, really. Here's, uh, here's the line for Nuke. It's still the most expensive, and all the others are going down. So right now, is this the time to start going towards a revival of the nuclear industry? No, it is not. But that is, in fact, what we're going to be doing. Uh, the new missions are going forward at the Advanced Test Reactor, which is a reactor that has been operating for decades and is kind of a workhorse. Uh, the Idaho Nuclear Technology and Engineering Center, that's where all the liquid waste is stored below ground. And then the Materials and Fuels Complex, and that's the, that's the kind of, that's where most of the reactor activity goes forward. So this is Experimental Breeder Reactor 2, and that's kind of, you know, it's now empty. All they have is that dome. Uh, so, so far in this new nuclear age, uh, INL has restarted a reactor that shut down in 1994. Um, and we have also sort of started to move back into or, or up the ante. INL never totally stopped reprocessing spent nuclear fuel, but we've upped the ante again. Uh, a new technology. Uh, what they're trying to do is pull uranium out of spent nuclear fuel and then enrich it more than what normal commercial reactors use. Uh, but what it does is it restarts, it re-legitimizes a weapons pro program. And it also, frankly, that there are no operating reactors that need the kind of fuel that that, pirate, that, that technology would produce right now. Um, there are also at INL going to be, could be, are planned new reactors. Um, the INL has been named the Nuclear Reactor Innovation Center. So, you know, 890 square miles, and our job, Idaho's job, could be to play host to up to 18 new nuclear reactors of experimental, techno uh, experimental technology. Uh, this is the one that is farthest along. It, is, uh, it was designed by New Scale. It will, will, would be, if it works, if it happens, owned by the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems and operated by Northwest Energy. And what it is, and again, for scale, you know, they, all, they really do always put that guy in there. Now he's wearing a red shirt. Um, it is, um, it, it'll be small reactors they're not that small. They're 60 megawatts, so certainly they're way smaller than a big nuclear reactor. The only nuclear reactor accidents that killed people immediately was the SL-1 at the Idaho National Laboratory. And that was a, an army reactor, and it was most certainly small. It was 200 to 400 kilowatts. It exploded, pushed out a control rod, the unfair part of it is, you know, it really had no containment dome. It was nothing. But it was a very small reactor. Three people died. And ultimately, and I think probably 1995, INL ended up scraping the surface off 75 acres to just scrape off the contamination, bury it, and start all over. So this is the reactor. Uh, it's about 35 acres it would cover. Um, all the reactors operating in the United States today, you know, kind of back to what is normal safety measures here today, uh, have a, an emergency um, evacuation zo zone of 10 miles and then an emergency planning zone out 50 miles. Um, and these reactors are safe and they're 
emergency planning zone will only go to the fence line. So um, the, that's the plan uh, to build these 12 reactors in eastern Idaho. All the electricity will either go to Idaho Falls or to um, little municipal power supplies in, in mostly in Utah, hence the name Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. I think of these small modular reactors as s'mores, radioactive s'mores, and that's because they produce more waste, they use more water, and they cost more money than normal reactors. Uh, and I think that they cost less to build, but, they, but the kilowatt per unit of power, they caught, your electricity will cost more. Uh, so they produce more waste, um, and that's because you know they, they are they use more enriched fuel, and then because they're small, they just pull out. If one assembly needs to be replaced, it's easier to just pull it all out and and put in a whole new reactor core. So they just pull out more, and that will be stored on site. Um, above our aquifer, and they cost substantially more money. So that's all I had to say. Uh, I do want to talk with you about the problems ahead. I think that there are, unfortunately, opportunities and needs for real activism. You know, we're the only site where the DO, INL is the only site in the United States Department of Energy that really focuses on nuclear power. So we're in a, you know, there are activists working on operating nuclear reactors. Uh, many of our colleagues are working on nuclear weapons and waste um, targeted for both, and those are very serious. We're where the next generation is going to be born. It's going to be born with our money. Those six, 12 reactors, they're figuring now, early day, $6 billion. The company is counting on half of it coming from the federal government. They'll be using our water, and there is no place for that waste to go. And, you know, as a target, state, it's hard to say, well, let's make it and send it someplace else. It's a real, it's a, it's a, I think there's a call to action. I think it's stoppable. Uh, everything is. The Alliance had, has done enormously successful work over the years. Um, we have good, strong allies. Our strongest allied group is in Utah, and they are going to get the electricity and not the waste but it's a responsible uh, civic group. And, you know, uh, Idaho needs nuclear waste like Turkey needs Christmas. And I am very happy to answer any questions or take any comments or uh, mediate any conversation between. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, that's right. Okay, so I was, um, uh, I haven't really dug all the way in, but I think, and you know, I, I do think that this, that INL has a very good cleanup program because of state and citizen concerns. Um, the, I also think that DOE offers to give up things it doesn't want to do anyway, and volunteers to do things that it does want to do. So it's, I mean, you know, here it is. I mean, it's a fait accompli. But um, for instance, INL is promising, or DOE is promising to ship out um, promising to ship out to WIP 
less waste than we already ship out. So, you know, that's not, it's, that's already happening. So I think, you know, every single agreement that the state has signed, I think has helped us not be, you know, just the fall guy. I mean, we were, you know, we were just the, the where, well, where would you bury plutonium? Someplace in the middle of nowhere. And I think the states, you know, in 1974, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission that um, said the people of Idaho did not, thought that waste should stay where it was. So I think, you know, it's always a mixed bag and, and um, we, I want more and, and the state, I don't support its um, flirtation with new nuclear projects out there because they always pollute. And, and you know, they're trying to restart a technology that died a natural death. Okay, I want you, I thank you so much. And I, and I gotta tell you, Idahoans have been fighting above their weight on nuclear issues for decades now. And I think we can do this. Thank you.